So thank you everyone uh, for choosing to come here today. I know there are a lot of great presenters and a lot of great information to get today, so I'm grateful you chose to come here and spend some time with me. I like to consider this talk more of a conversation than me just sitting here giving some information. So as questions come up or comments, or if you want to tell me everything I'm talking about is completely wrong, I'd love to hear it. Uh, so just chime in as you have it. So I am Austin Higgins. I might be a little more unique than some of the uh, other presenters here. I am not a 100% dedicated true agilist. Uh, I work in a lot of different aspects of management and technology consulting from you know, finance to product and software development to product marketing and some more of the digital and kind of heavy technical marketing as well. Uh, so Agile is just one piece of how um, some of the work that I do comes together. So I want to go through what I call practical business value. Uh, this has come through uh, some consulting work I've done for a few different clients. Uh, and I noticed a trend where a lot of companies would start and stop different projects. You know, where they would put together their roadmap or their plans and you know, the program level and say, we're going to accomplish this much stuff. They get started and they stop. And I kept asking the question, why do companies um, start and stop all the time? And I think it's because they don't have clear direction. Um, and they're wasting a lot of money. And I have a finance and accounting background. So I decided to approach this problem from a finance perspective and really look at what is the value of the different projects that companies are working on and how can they get a little smarter about the value they want to extract from these projects. Typically, I would go over a little bit of an Agile and Scrum intro, but we all know what that is here. So I'm going to go ahead and skip through that. I was asking myself this morning uh, as I was walking to a coffee shop thinking, you know, why does business value even really matter? Um, you know, to a company, you know, what is the purpose of getting you know, more value out of their projects? And I mean, it's pretty obvious. I mean, companies need to make money. They have bills to pay. You know, but it really came to me as you know, business value is the reward that companies get for serving their customers. So the customers really should be the focus. The end user should always be the focus uh, of work that a technology organization would do. But the reward of that work should be an increase in business value. It, is, it isn't always that case, but that's what it should be. Uh, and practical business value is, that, is the real quantifiable, not pie in the sky, crazy numbers people come up with, but real hard numbers. So the, the explanation of business value kind of comes into a couple different categories. Um, but really, the business value answers the question, you know, what's the tangible benefits of a project? or the tangible benefits of an epic or a program or an organization at any level. It's what's real. Um, you know, a lot of organizations will look at um, perceived value or you know, their position in the market or even customer satisfaction to an extent can be intangible. But w what's the real value of, of a project and what are the quantifiable impacts? Now, just because they're non-quantifiable or maybe a little softer benefits doesn't mean they're not worthy of being included. It's just the, the real practical value is the hard numbers, things like revenue, cost savings, market share, uh, net promoter score to an extent, if that's something that drives uh, growth in your business. Uh, working capital reduction uh, can be a real benefit, but oftentimes it's not a real benefit. It's more of a paper benefit. Uh, but there's also the non-quantifiable. So when you're thinking of business value and you're thinking of the rewards for serving customers, they can fall in either category. So practical business value within the organization. Yeah. Because I have a finance background, I've always approached projects in the same way. How much money is this going to make me? Or how much money can a company make off of whatever it is they're doing? And I would make decisions saying, you know, the ROI is one you know, number here, and it's higher over here. So let's focus on the ROI you know, or any other financial metric. But really, the business value doesn't exist in a vacuum. It comes together, and what I see is three real components. Uh, if you're looking at a project or a program or even an epic, uh, you can look at the technical dependencies, answering the question, is this even feasible? You know, can we accomplish this? And also look at the customer requirements. Do your customers care about it? Will it make their lives better? Do they not know about it, but once they have it, you know they're going to love it? Uh, and that can be internal or external customers. And then the business value piece as well. Uh, I'm focusing on the business value uh, piece, but it has to fit in with these other components. If you focus just on the money, you, you might be underserving your customers. Uh, if, you f uh, if you focus just on what your customers want, you might actually be able to do it. The technical requirements may be too much. <coughs> 
So I know we're a couple minutes in. Any questions, any comments? Just want to give uh, a couple opportunities for that. All right then. So if you're looking at three different ways to really look at the value of something, three different ways you need to score a project, uh, an easy way to do this is through weighted business value, using just simple, uh, straightforward weighting uh, of kind of a score across these three categories. So when you're considering the group of projects, you would rank them all individually in these categories of technical requirements, customer requirements, and business value. Uh, and then once they're ranked, you would create some sort of weight, or you can just do a flat rate. I'll show you a couple examples. This is about as simple as it gets with math, but I've used this a number of times with clients and uh, directors to help them figure out what they should do. Because you really want to look at quantifiable metrics and look at how you can measure a decision. Uh, an example of how you use something very similar to this was not in software development or product development, but in a marketing launch. A client was trying to look at what is the best way to launch this new software that they had created. And they had all these different lists, but we, we came up with the very simple metrics of what they were trying to accomplish uh, and what their budgets were and what they thought could actually reach that. The same thing applies here. You want to look at technical, customer, and value. So we've got a couple examples here, just made up numbers on a 1 to 5 scale. It can be 1 to 10, it can be 1 to 100, none of that really matters as long as it's consistent. And here, the projects can be ranked and combined to create an overall score. Then you can look at, you know, project A in this example is an 11, project C is a 9. You may not really know that unless you um, kind of added everything up together. Sure. How long does it take to come to this point to have an overall understanding of the technical requirements, what the customer wants to do with the person that you know, right? They're right. setting up the product. How long does it take? How much time or how many sprints or months does it take to get to that point? You know, it a lot of it depends on the, the, the complexity. So there are, you know, I've worked on projects in the past. For one, for example, was an e-commerce platform. It was pretty straightforward. You know, you want to stand up a new platform to sell some stuff. And that was easy in itself. But then when we looked at the self-service aspect of that, because it was interfacing with so many customer groups and so many pieces of technology, it was a lot harder. So that took months. And if you have the right people in the room, you can do it in a day. It's just it could take you six months to find the right people and get them in, in the same room to each other. I know that's kind of a cop-out answer, so I apologize for that, but uh, it could be a couple weeks, could be a couple months, sir. Go ahead and... So, you, you list your customer requirements or customer value, and my question to you is how many are you gathering data? Are you going to customers and asking them, or are you taking data from sales who are talking to customers and saying, you know, our customers want this? Uh, so, where is that data coming from? To be honest, both. I, I believe the best way to get to know your customers is just to ask them. But there's also some, you know, customers don't always know what they want. And customers don't always know what the trends they're buying. And I can guarantee you Amazon has some interesting trends about the different books that I buy that I don't even know about myself. And so looking at the sales data and some of the metadata that exists, I think it's a good kind of starting point to understand. Look at trends. What are your customers doing? Where do you think they're going? But then validate that with actual conversations. I mean, you can do the, you know, bring people in for the focus groups or have your sales teams actually, you know, pick customers at random to do interviews with. But as much customer interaction as early as possible. Right. I would accidentally win. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's, you know, that's why I was bringing up the second piece. There's one you can just do the flat score, you add it together and you're done. But it's a little smarter to look at the weighting. And it could be from a political standpoint, the technical piece person is the person you really need to convince. So maybe you have to weight his, you know, uh, piece a little higher. Or maybe the person who controls all the money is the marketing group. So you really have to look at what the customers care about. You know, and that's the soft side of figuring out your priority for different projects. You're absolutely right. It's easy to manipulate. Anytime you're looking at a basic model, it's very, very easy to manipulate the outcome. Uh, and that's where hopefully the, um, you know, the stakeholders and the people who are making this decision are on the same page of what you're trying to accomplish. Hopefully. I mean, we all know that rarely happens, but we can dream. 
So uh, as the gentleman point out in this example, you can look at weighting things a little separately um, and just apply a simple um, you know, percentage weight on each of these three uh, and just multiply by that, add them together, and you can see that these are all exactly the same from this weighting scale. Uh, and then at that point, you would have to figure some other way to score these and decide uh, what you want to go for. So with the financial business value, you know, you know, the hard numbers behind some of the, the practical business value, there's really three different pieces in Agile. Uh, in Agile methodology, you can get the, the value from. One is the deployment value. So what are you actually deploying at the end? Uh, if in six months you're going live with something that's going to give you a very specific financial benefit, let's say it's a million dollars, you know it's a million dollars. But there's also a development value. You know, by doing things in an iterative manner, and there are models and ways to calculate how you would save um, by iterating versus doing a waterfall. That exists, so I'm not going into too much detail on that. But there's a way that you can save money from an, in an agile manner that way. Uh, there's also the testing value. This is re sometimes a little harder to figure out what you actually saved from or what you gained from a value standpoint. When it's all said and done and you're looking back at each point that you tested or if you're interacting with customers at, you know, at different iterations throughout the project and you're shifting, you can look backwards and say, six months ago, a year ago, we talked with customers and realized we were going in this path and we need to be going in this path. And you can assign a value to that, uh, which really helps to the finance and some of the more kind of standard business units to show that by doing things in an agile manner, not only are we shipping product, but we're saving money in the process. So it's definitely something to consider. Um, the testing piece is often the hardest. So my question mm -hmm. is, Define value of the just code that's there for testing and product that's not in production. Yes, and then you're separating it, the testing value. So it's not necessarily. Correct. So it's not necessarily you know QA testing, so that there's value in you know testing code. It's the idea that when it's everything's said and done in a project and you've shipped it, looking backwards, there may have been points in the agile development. Uh, cycle that you made decisions that created additional value for the business. But I don't have a development cycle. The only development cycle I have is two weeks. And that's what I test as well. So then it, it may not apply on a two week uh, on a two week sprint, it very well may not apply. So then how do you account if teams are working truly in agile? Because if it's a waterfall project right. Depending on the technology in data warehouse, you might see that okay, they do all the development and testing in one sprint, and then they do testing, system testing, and UAT in another sprint. If the stories are categorized that way, right. then they are not delivering minimum viable product there. I see this, but otherwise, I don't see the value, or why should you even have it? Okay, uh, and I completely understand that. Process, so it seems like it's you know, I do see on, you know, depending on how, uh, how much a, an organization has adopted Agile, you're absolutely right. You know, companies that, and organizations adopt to a certain point. And most organizations don't apply Agile in the same ways. So a lot of organizations, you're absolutely right. There, it may not be very valuable to look backwards all the time and see how you did things slightly different. But if you're l working on a large scale program, a multi-hundred million dollar program, uh, and that's three to five years, that, that's how much long it takes to finish what you would like to be able to finish from a customer standpoint. Okay. There may be value. Even we did large project, project they took us almost two years, but we broke them down based by functionality. We were able to deliver on a monthly basis that something that was tested, checked, good, okay, we will couple it up and every three months we put them in production, but it was never broken up like that. Okay. And like I said, it may not apply everywhere. You're absolutely right. So then this has nothing to do with the agile. 
<laughs> it does. It's just maybe not in every case for Agile. Sure. But I, I do like the points, and I like you challenging. Um, you know, I'm one person with you know, my experience and my background, and you're a person that has equally valuable, and everyone else here does too, so I appreciate your challenge. This goes into a little more detail on um, you know, development ty um, deployment, development, and testing value that uh, I think we all, all can agree may or may not apply. Uh, another piece to really consider uh, in the business value is the total cost of ownership. This is pretty common in forecasting and budgeting, uh, but it's all often forgot about uh, with uh, the business value piece. That you know, one half of the business value is often the cost associated with attaining that value, and total cost of ownership, uh, everything from you know hardware, um, you know real estate services, even keeping the lights on. Sometimes you need to include that. Other times you don't. That's more of a, a financial planning question. So business value accuracy, a lot of questions uh, that come up and even places I've struggled in the past is how can I be more accurate in projecting the value of something or guessing at what something is going to be worth? So the cone of uncertainty, uh, this was uh, adopted from uh, uh, another tool for looking at accuracy of requirements. Uh, the concept that business value will become more accurate as a launch date approaches and it will become less accurate the further out that you project. So what does this really mean for a business? Uh, assumptions are the most important thing in, a, in business value. You know, and we'll use a, a very basic uh, example of forecasting revenue off of a product launch. And that may not always apply, but it's a really simple example to use. You can believe that you're going to launch it in six months, or that's when you actually do end up launching it. And for the first year, you're going to make $10 million in revenue. And then you say you're going to grow by 20% every year. And then, you know, five years later, you're making so much money. The idea that you can guess how much money you're going to make in five years, to be honest with you, is kind of absurd for most products and projects. So you have to really focus in on your assumptions. So if you're expecting, you know, so many customers to adopt in year one, you have to really know why. And you have to have really hard data, uh, really hard customer data, marketing, and um, um, and every kind of data that you can pull in to really understand why you believe what you believe. And the further out, the less accurate you're going to be. And that is a hard thing to convince uh, stakeholders and people on that are making the decision and cutting the checks when they say, what is this going to make me? And it's like, well, we know it's going to make you this next year or after that, you know, plus or minus 100% or plus or minus whatever the percent ends up being. So it's a piece that I've struggled with in the past and a lot of other organizations that have uh, struggled as well. And uh, the only real way to work through this is being upfront that the further out you project or the further out you, you guess, uh, the less likelihood you are, are going to be of accurate. So sometimes five or 10 year projections are they're meaningless. They're absolutely absurd. I just wanted to say many companies who are trying to project five, 10 years, they are not around anymore. Right. You know, there's, uh, I read a quote, and it was, you know, everyone talks about Facebook and you know, how they're doing certain things right, and it's a great example, but, you know, they were talking about their planning, and they said they have a six-month plan and a 30-year plan, and every six months they change the 30-year plan. So they know where they're going to be in six months, and they know where they'd like to be 30 years from now. Uh, but everything in between, they really don't have hard, a hard plan for that. So I'm going to go into... Um, calculating business value, some more information on how to actually look at projects and how to classify different types of business value. So there are a couple uh, kind of basic categories, revenue, cost savings, or net income, uh, and working capital. Working capital is often used in, the larger the organization, the more they talk about working capital. Uh, in the simplest way, it's the difference between uh, what is owed to you and what you owe someone else. So if you have a you know, million dollars you know, that's outstanding to you and a million dollars outstanding to someone else, you really have zero working capital. A lot of companies, so the larger they get, the more they focus on this because it's an easy paper win. Uh, it's not necessarily real value. But it's, it comes up a lot in organizations, especially when we're looking at uh, operational efficiency in, in finance centers. But the easiest ones, revenue, how much money, you know, what, you know, how much money is this, co this project or organization going to make? And the questions that come up is, will this project interact with customers? If it does, then maybe there's some revenue impact. 
Uh, will the project increase the likelihood of additional sales? Once again, I'm not saying will it increase sales, but the likelihood of sales. Will this project increase the likelihood of additional sales from new customers or current customers? Cost savings, net income, will the project simplify internal process? It's, those are the really straightforward pieces. And working capital, if there's, uh, will the project reduce the amount of time it will take to receive payment from customers or extend uh, paying vendors? And within that, uh, there's a few other financial business value components. Simple revenue, uh, simple cost savings, simple net uh, income. Those are the most basic financial um, kind of value pieces you'll probably find on projects. It's going to make a, we're going to get a thousand new customers or unfortunately we're going to reduce a bunch of headcounts because we're automating an internal system. Not my favorite business value, but companies, the larger they get, the more they like to focus on reducing headcount or allocated headcount. Simple net income, um, very straightforward. Uh, break even uh, is you know an easy way to judge projects from one or another. It's when will the value meet the cost but not exceed? So if it's going to cost you a million dollars for a project, at what point will you have a million dollars in value? Um, net present value, it's a little more advanced uh, financial term. I'm not sure how many people in here have finance backgrounds or how much you know about um, about these, but it's what is tomorrow's dollar worth in today's dollar. You know, it's the um, reverse of inflation. Internal rate of return. So at what, sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to ask if it's a sure. definition of the other than So the question that I wanted to ask you as a person in finance, right, with finance background, how do you help your organization of driving business value when we already have all these tools and everything put in place to be able to forecast the project, right? So that's why I ask. Right. Because we have a certain amount of discovery period to understand if it's a large project, right? And then the key is to work iteratively and build it up. So how the finance community is getting closer to the technology right. and the business so we can report out the same thing. Because this is the traditional way it was my MBA course. <laughs> right, it is. It's the, it's the standard corporate finance, absolutely. And, but is there any, any will or any to come together, try to see what would be the best way to merge the way things are being done nowadays in technology and how to go ahead and apply the figures that are required as well? You know, as you mentioned, this is the, the, the basic corporate finance, the basic stuff you learn in any MBA class. The challenging piece is the assumptions that go into these. That, that's the piece that matters the most. Because all of this is basic math. It's built on whatever the assumptions that you create. And technology creates a piece of those assumptions. Finance does as well, and so does the business. So the goal is getting those assumptions to be on the same page and speaking the same language. That's where all the challenge is, and that's where the success will be, is getting everyone to have the same assumptions and have the same data backing up those assumptions. A couple of basic steps for calculating business value. Um, first, figure out what type of value that you actually want to calculate as a project revenue generating, as a cost savings. Uh, are you more concerned with a break even? Uh, or if you want to look at comparing projects to net present value, or is there working capital impact? Um, then select how you're actually going to calculate this. Calculate it and then stack rank um, at whatever level that you're comparing. So where to begin with calculating value? Uh, a lot of people would just assume you start at the top and work down. Some people may assume you start at the bottom and work up. I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, I believe you should look more at a project level first, then break it down a little bit, then add everything up to get to the program level, and then go a little deeper. The reason why I say to go this way, and it does look a little out of order, uh, is to have enough information to communicate to a lot of different groups. Most people don't really care about uh, the epic level, other than um, the person that's in, involved in just that one project. Oftentimes, people cutting checks have a lot of projects, a lot of programs, a lot of epics to, um, to consider and to be aware of. So if you start at a project level, then go a little deeper to get some more information, add everything up to report out on a, a program, and then continue the analysis.
not all epics are created equal, not all projects are, not all programs, and that's okay. Likely some of the projects or epics or whatever you're valuing, a small percent will have the most of the value. It's the very basic 80-20, everyone knows this, but it still applies in business value. The reason I bring this up is I was working on a project and the payback period was 33 years, uh, and it was just one piece of an overall uh, platform um, redo, and the business was really concerned. It's like, how can we you know, invest a few million dollars or we're not gonna get our money back for 31 years? Like, well, that's, that's okay, because this is a, a necessary piece for the overall platform. And that's where we look more at the customer requirements. The customer says, we need this. It's not the most compelling business value, uh, but we have to have it to finish the platform. So we went ahead with it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Uh, PCA always comes up, especially in, in e-commerce. It's kind of a, it's a go, no go. Either you have it or you're not in business. So when it comes to uh, the regulation piece, you could easily just say the business value is every penny we're going to make off of this. Because if we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there's nothing you can do about it. So that, you know, in the three areas that I broke down, maybe you can consider that a technical requirement. Maybe it's a customer slash market slash regulatory requirement, but that's a perfect example. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of these different categories. I won't go into too much detail. Um, we don't want to look at a, an accounting lecture here. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, chime in. Simple revenue. Uh, it's, it's just the total amount of revenue that a project or product will create over a period of time. Very straightforward. This could be quarterly, monthly, uh, annually. If a lot of businesses want to look at five to ten years, that's fine. It's just not the best way to do it. Sometimes you can't get around it. So it, the reason it matters for business, uh, it's obvious you need money coming in the door. So calculating simple revenue, just the amount of future additional revenue or the total or additional revenue for new or uh, existing uh, customers. So it's important to look at, you can have a product that will reach, provide additional value uh, to a customer, or you could have a product that will go after completely new customers or a combination of them. Um, and it's good to look at every uh, potential scenario. There are a few examples in here. I've used this, uh, this talk in a few different places. Uh, we don't need to go and calculate the simple revenue, but the idea is you can have additional information, especially when you look at just the revenue. You don't care about the cost. If the goal is revenue, um, like a marketing organization, a sales organization, they care about their cost. Operations might care about net income. Technology is going to care about their operating costs. Every group cares about something differently. So you're going to have a lot of pieces of information coming together, uh, but the, if you're pleasing marketing and sales, they probably only want to look at the revenue. That's not necessarily accurate. Maybe they need to be looking at more, but the truth is some people only care about what they care about. So the idea is you'll have additional information you may need to ignore based on the stakeholders you're talking to. Just a couple example calculations from uh, the sample. So simple cost savings. Uh, it's, you know, um, how much money a, a project, a program, something is going to save an organization. It could be measured, it's typically measured in dollars, could be measured in headcount or allocated headcount that's not necessarily going to let anyone go, but it's just going to reallocate resources from one area to another. You know, this, some people say cost savings is, a, you know, the mo more important than revenue because you're keeping more um, of the money that you're actually bringing in. That debate is still out, I would agree. It's better to have a higher net income and focus your efforts there. So another example, same concept as before, where there's a lot of information that matters in a cost-saving standpoint. Uh, revenue is more or less irrelevant. So some more example calculations. This deck will be available for anyone who does want it, uh, if you're so inclined to look at some of these calculations a little more detail. Simple net income. Uh, really straightforward, revenue minus your expense gets your net income. There are two different ways you can really in improve your net income. One is making more money while keeping your uh, operating expenses the same, or have the same amount of revenue, reduce your operating expenses, or a combination of the two. So there's a couple extra steps. First, you have to look at um, simple revenue. 
either the actual that you're getting today or any improvements that you'll likely make, and then the total operating costs, actuals, or any improvements. The remaining benefit, very straightforward, is the net income. So another example, um, just to show that there's always additional information and you really need to focus in on the pieces of information that matter, and then also testing your assumptions. Break even, at what point will this project's cost be recovered by whatever value that's coming in? And that could be you know, cost savings, net income, it could be revenue, whatever it is, what, at what point will this, will this come in? Hopefully it'll be months, maybe quarters, so not too long in years, depending on the size. Um, the example I talked about earlier, 31 years, sometimes that happens and there's no way around it. Are you saying that break even and all these things that you are talking about is calculatable at each epic level? It can be. It doesn't necessarily mean it always is. And I know I've thrown this answer out a few times, so maybe, but the truth is sometimes uh, an epic can have a, re a revenue generating component. Sometimes it can have a cost savings component, especially looking at not, um, maybe not a true MVP, but some additional functionality you're adding on to an MVP, where if you added you know, maybe some automation, it would save you a little bit of time. The automation isn't required. So that, that's an example of how an Epic could have its own unique value. An Epic may have a break-even point, it may not. Uh, and that is um, sometimes hard to calculate, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. So the reason break-even matters for business is it allows business stakeholders and the people writing checks to know when they're going to get their money back. And that's always, when you, anytime you ask someone for money, uh, they're always going to know what am I going to get for it, so what's the value, and when am I going to get my return, so when is the value going to exceed my cost. So this is one of the, in my opinion, a very important thing to convey to, to business stakeholders. A visual representation, you know, when is the, re the benefit going to exceed the cost or meet the cost. I have an, another example, uh, same in line with the, the other ones. Uh, a lot of information, some of it may or may not be valid, but always test your assumptions and focus on what's going to get you to your calculations. Another way to show the calculations in chart form and table form, uh, whatever you believe is best for your business stakeholders to get the message across that yes, you're going to get some money or you're going to get some value back. Net present value. Net present value is an easy way to uh, compare different projects or compare the value of different projects. Very basic in you know graduate and even a lot of undergraduate finance courses. So if you have any of that background, you'll understand this really well. So calculating your uh, the project or program uh, net present value you just need you know, the total value going forward, the amount of time and some sort of discount rate. You know, finance groups always have a discount rate um, or cost of capital. That, that's something should always be provided. They're often you know, as low as 6 or 8%, sometimes as high as 25%, depending on the industry and the company. Uh, but that should be information that's given to you uh, by the organization. And you run some very simple calculations uh, in financial calculators or in Excel uh, to show you what, in today's dollar, all future benefits will be. <coughs> Another example and a few steps on calculating net present value uh, using Excel. There's simple formulas you can use. It's not very hard at all. I'm sure everyone in here has done something pretty similar to it. Internal rate of return. This is another way to compare projects. Internal rate of return is the rate of return for a project that yields a net present value equal to zero. Uh, so it's just a way to compare different projects that may have larger costs, smaller costs, different levels of value. Uh, it's a comparison to great equalizer across projects. Once again, another example to kind of walk through. Um, you'll have a lot of different pieces of information, but uh, cost is always important, so is the value. Uh, test the assumptions. I keep saying that, test the assumptions. That's one of the most important things uh, in calculating business value. Steps on how to do this in Excel. Uh, but there are plenty of other tutorials that exist. That's why I didn't include anything too detailed. Return on investment. When people are cutting checks for projects or for programs, they always want to know, what am I going to get out of this? This is the, sim the simplest thing to convey and one of the hardest things to really um, communicate or to calculate. Because you need to know all of your return, all of your, your cost, and then hopefully some sort of time horizon when it's all going to come back. 
very straightforward. Total benefit minus total cost over the total cost. We all know this. We've had to do this on a daily basis. Um, but you'll be surprised at how many times organizations forget just to put together a simple ROI. They get started. They, uh, they keep moving forward. They're you know, standing up teams, getting projects going, getting sprints set up. And then they never really stop to think, what is my true ROI? Why am I doing this? But why you know, did I rank these against my business value, my technical requirements, and my customer requirements? Most organizations forget the very simple things. A couple more examples, like I said, um, we don't need to go in into uh, every little detail. Another piece, reporting business value. So you've done, you know, done the work of stack ranking, you've figured out what kind of benefits every project's going to get, uh, and then you need to communicate it out. The simplest way, I believe, is always the best way of just a simple description, a chart, and the raw numbers. Keep it straightforward. People typically, sure. It could be. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is just you know a, a sample, so it's not you know, indicative of a real project. So, keeping reporting simple and showing um, just the information that matters to whatever the project is. There are a lot of business value templates. There's plenty of them that exist. Uh, I don't believe any one's better than any other one. So the final step, what to do after the project completes, after you ship your MVP. You know, if you're still iterating, of course, you would do this on a regular basis or at whatever point the business wants to. Uh, but the most important thing is to actually capture the business value. Another piece that organizations rarely do uh, that I've seen is actually going back and saying, we thought this project was going to give us X. It has been a certain amount of time afterwards. Did we get X? Uh, and if your experience has been everywhere, every company you've worked with always does that, I'd be really surprised, uh, but also really excited to hear companies doing it the right way. Typically companies, once they're done, they don't always go back and capture their value. That, that is uh, one of the most important pieces, is to actually know, did you do things right? Because then you can look back at your assumptions and say, were our assumptions right? How good are we at calculating value? How good are we at uh, really knowing what the, the triggers are um, to capture the value? So I'd like to open up any, any questions. I know we had you know, quite a few going on, but want to see um, if any other ones come up. All right, I'm glad you guys came. I know we finished up a little early. I, I skipped over a few pieces, but thank you very much.